Like many other YouTubers, the Amnesia games have been consistently making me piss myself for over a decade now. I love the Amnesia series, but I gotta say, none of the sequels have held a candle to the original masterpiece of The Dark Descent. That is, until June of 2023, when we were graced with The Bunker, a game that, in my opinion, is the best thing Frictional has created since 2010. And yes, I'm including Soma in that assessment. Soma is great, Rebirth is good, but what those games left behind was what The Dark Descent excelled in, which was a little thing I like to call gameplay. I feel like some players and critics seem to forget or disregard that Dark Descent was as groundbreaking as it was explicitly because of its gameplay. Possibly due to the fact that for the decade following the original Amnesia, Frictional went off in a much more story-based direction, with two games that included a whole lot of walking and very light puzzle work. But without the Dark Descent's bold, legendary design decision to leave the player completely defenseless in the face of the unearthly horrors of Castle Brennenburg, I genuinely believe Believe we never would have received Outlast, or Alien Isolation, or Slender, or even fucking PT. And now, with the bunker, Frictional is finally returning to what made Dark Descent revolutionary for its time, and that is clever, creative, and concise horror systems design. The gameplay is the real meat of the bunker, with the story being a tasty sprinkle and a spice on top as opposed to the other way around. And boy does it make for one fillin' meal of a horror game. God damn! But before we dive into the details of what makes this harrowing adventure so excellent, I gotta stop you right here and say, go play the game first. It's only like three to five hours long, you can do it in one sitting if your sphincter muscles are well exercised. On one hand, part of me wants to recommend you start on normal because that's the way I did it before moving on to hard mode with my second playthrough, but on the other hand, my second playthrough on hard was when all the intricacies of the game design really began to reveal themselves to form this masterful game of cat and mouse since the higher difficulty required me to utilize all the millimeters of my smooth little pea brain. So I don't know. I'd say start on hard if you're a horror veteran who's already familiar with standard survival horror mechanics like like resource management and standard amnesia mechanics like cruising for cabinets to hide from things that want to rip your guts out. Now without further ado, let's take a look at what makes this terrifying war-torn tale so special. And that is... Systemic scares. The gameplay systems that power the bunker are so numerous that it's kind of hard to know where to start. Therefore, I'm just going to break down the mechanics one by one in order to showcase the game's overall complexity. It's time to go over 10 individual systems of the bunker, starting with my love, the light of my life, the generator. Being able to see is important. I can't go into my own bathroom at night without imagining the shower man peeking at me from over the curtain. So you can guess how scary it is to wander around a bunker that is actually home to a giant monster without the assistance of illumination. That is where Generator Chan comes in. Fuck Ashley, forget Link and his jiggly balls physics, this is the video game waifu of 2023. There are two modes of play in the bunker. Lights on, or lights off. This roughly translates to fucked, or completely fucked. You fuel the generator with the randomly generated canisters that spawn throughout the bunker, and whether or not the generator is on determines if our buddy the Rat King generally stays in his rat holes until you start causing a ruckus, or wanders around completely out in the open. You can imagine which of these two options is preferable. You can fill up the generator with more or less fuel, and the amount of fuel of course determines how long the damn thing stays on, something you can monitor with your handy dandy pocket watch, which, by the way, takes up an inventory slot. System number two, Vim inventory slots. Y'all know what an inventory is, you've, you've seen one of these before. You begin the game with six slots in your inventory to carry around your weapon, your flashlight, and a multitude of other optional items that can be used to create new items, or help solve problems, or defend yourself from a deadly defacing, if it comes down to that. When you're gearing up to leave the comfort of your Resident Evil-esque safe room to scout out areas of the bunker and attempt to complete objectives, you'll want to offload as many unnecessary items as possible into your safe room's chest so you're able to grab more items when you're out in the field so you can solve more problems in the future. This means you gotta make hard calls, both in the safe room and out in the bunker. Do you take that pocket watch with you on your next excursion so you can monitor how much time left before the next blackout? Or do you take the risk of leaving behind that pocket watch so you have more room for, say, extra fuel you come across, or cloth for health items and anti-rat sticks, or even a key item that's required to progress in other parts of the environment? Do you use that last inventory slot on some vital fuel, or a grenade you saw a few rooms back? Amnesia, colon, the decisions. System number three, the interconnected environment. 
In contrast to Frictional's previous games, which were largely linear experiences that had you moving from level to level as they sprinkled in the occasional open area, the bunker takes place in one large interconnected map, where every area is accessible from the get-go. Well, not entirely. Let me in. Let me in. There are plenty of obstacles in the way, like locked wooden doors, padlocks, vents with special screws, chains, and more that are blocking you from simply getting to where you need to go from the aforementioned get-go. But luckily, having that interconnected environment paired with the game's multiple objectives means that if you get stuck on a problem, you can always just divert to another part of the map and try to solve a different problem there, all while gathering resources as well as potentially new key items that might funnel you back to where you were in order to solve that previous problem. System number four, sound. You're gonna wanna shut the fuck up in this game. Nearly everything you do emits varying amounts of sound. Everything from tossing a grenade to dropping a single item you picked up. <laughs> Running causes sound. Traps cause sound. Being too close to these bulbous ass rats causes sound. You must always be mindful of your DBs because this dude is never far from your position. Tying into system number four is number five, the flashlight. This is a simple one, but it's really fucking clever. So apparently in the First World War, soldiers were equipped with death trap flashlights, devices that yelled out, please come shoot me Germans, as you had to charge them up like a lawnmower in order to get any light going. And while you charged them, they emitted a sound equivalent to that of a jet engine taking off. Simply put, your flashlight must be charged, and it makes noise when you do so. Pretty fucked, but also pretty genius horror design. Are you gonna charge that bitch up sporadically to stay as quiet as possible while only having enough light for a couple seconds at a time? Or are you gonna risk tugging past that 900 decibel third charge so you actually see where the fuck you're going? Human sight is generally helpful, but only if where you're going isn't into the jaws of a 10 foot wide rat man mouth. System number six is the, the big, big iron, iron on your hip. hip. To me, this was really cool to see. Ever since the original Amnesia, all the way back in 2010, frictional joints have never given you means of defending yourself. This defenselessness was THE key component that set The Dark Descent apart from its horror peers. It's what made the game so unique and horrifying from a gameplay standpoint, and it was such an effective and well-executed design decision that it sent shockwaves across the landscape of horror games, influencing a large portion of spooky titles for the entire decade of the 2010s. So you can perhaps see why having a revolver in an amnesia game is a big fucking deal. And because the bunker isn't just any other horror game, this pistol isn't just any other video game gun. It is not a mere death dealer for disposing of disposable enemies in your path. This gun is a tool for both self-defense and problem solving. Will you use one bullet on the beast to stun it so you can flee to what might pass for safety? Or do you unload multiple bullets to get the beast to flee away from you temporarily? Or, or do you instead forego confrontation entirely and hide in a classic amnesia armoire in order to hold on to those bullets so you can later explode a lock or start blasting some ankle nibbling rats out your path? This gun is a little game in and of itself, a game of resource management and sound management. On the topic of sound, this thing's got a fucking kick and a half. This is one of the few video game guns that actually feels like a gun. The recoil is heavy and the shots are cacophonous. Its design strongly emphasizes the inherently frightening nature of firearms, and by proxy, war itself. Yet another thing that makes this revolver so cool are the immersive elements of its design. In order to check your ammo count, you need to pop open that chamber and take a look yourself, as opposed to being easily informed by a non-diegetic HUD. You must load every bullet by hand, one at a time and to do so means using both hands, which necessitates putting away that flashlight, potentially leaving you in total darkness. Yeah, fuck that. One final note, much like a real revolver, spent bullet casings don't come out of the gun until you empty them. So you can fool yourself into thinking you have bullets when you don't, if you do not dump the casings after use. The first time I pulled the trigger thinking I had a bullet chambered and received nothing but a sharp click in response was the moment I realized this was a brilliant horror game. System number seven, key items. Can you really call yourself a horror game if you don't have bolt cutters? The bunker knows the answer to this question is no, which is why it gives you multi-use bolt cutters alongside a handful of other useful special items like a lighter, a gas mask, and a screw thing, a thing to unscrew screws. Each of these items has its own purpose, and not all of them are mandatory. On my first playthrough, I entirely missed the gas mask and the lighter, so on my second run through I went straight for them and they noticeably changed up the experience. System number eight, we'll scare you with our insane rats. Now rats are cute, this is a fact. 
But the bunker's rats are different. They make you want to go <laughs> Rats serve as an important obstacle in the bunker, often standing between you and your life-certifying objectives. And they serve as a perfect example of this game's play-your-way-light design philosophy as a barrier that can be surmounted in multiple ways. You can shoot them, you can grenade them, you can burn the bodies they eat, you can scare them off temporarily with a torch, you can attempt Operation Rat Jump, where you try to long jump over them as they feast on your Achilles tendons. They're a great stopping block with many varied solutions that you can attempt based on the resources you have available in the moment. And because they're also bitches that serve as alarm bells for their master if you get too close, stay scared of these insane rats. Penultimate system number nine, random generation. When I talked about horror games over half a fucking decade ago in some old ass video, I said this. That's a big problem with straight horror games. They're often very similar every time you play through them. And horror simply can't exist when you know exactly what's gonna happen next. The Bunker solves the issue of the limited replayability of horror games to an extent by implementing randomly generated elements into each playthrough. In the game's own words, items, traps, codes, and more are all random. Those locker codes that hide away key items? They're gonna be different next time. That voice you heard listing off numbers over the radio? Different next time. Items, traps, codes, and more, folks. Each playthrough of the bunker is slightly different based on this random generation. And based on our 10th system, this guy. In case you hadn't noticed, a long-necked ghoul is constantly stalking you through the halls of the bunker, never more than a few hallways or wallways away as you move from objective to objective. He's hungry and he wants to eat your balls. He reacts to sound, he pops out of holes that look way too small for his giant misshapen head, and he will snap your neck like some balsa wood without a second thought, because he has no thoughts, because he's a fucked up 500 pound rat worm. I really do love how this creature utilizes the stalker enemy trope that was defined by Nemesis in 1999 and refined by Alien Isolation Xenomorph and RE2's Mr. X in the 2010s. It's so fucking cool to see Frictional's take on that concept. As is customary with Frictional titles though, they crank the tension up to 11 by having this slender fingered fuck trailing you through the entire game. There is no respite aside from one aside where you're briefly faced with a different antagonist, whereas the previous games I mentioned give the player large breaks from the starring creature throughout their run times. And that, my friends, is a list of 10 different systems in Amnesia the Bunker. Which isn't even all of them, by the way. There's still remaining systems like crafting, and hiding, and wounds, and physics interactions, and metal doors versus wood doors, and a fully simulated body, all packed into an elaborate yet lean 5 hour package that is cut like Brad Pitt in Fight Club. 0% body fat on this bitch. This concoction of a short game built upon a litany of simple systems that interlock to create a more complex whole results in a fantastically memorable horror experience. One that constantly has you solving macro problems in the objectives it gives you alongside micro problems within and between the individual systems to create an hours long string of tense moments, large and small. You've always got the obvious objectives to bounce between as your core goals, but between achieving those goals, you're also juggling time management with a generator, light and sound management with your flashlight and weapons, resource management with your inventory and chest and key items, health management with your shaky hands and fucked up rats, and so on and so on, yada yada yada. For an example though, just to showcase with a concrete sample how these systems all work together to create a fluid stream of unpredictable bullshit, let's say you're on your way to the soldiers quarters to unlock the communications room so you can use the radio inside. You search through the open level and find a key, but your inventory's full, so you gotta drop a grenade. You use the newfound key to unlock the communications door, only to discover that the radio needs a special switch to be flipped in order to work, which is located somewhere else in the soldiers' quarters. Suddenly, the lights go out. You haven't been checking your stopwatch. You whip out your flashlight and charge it up, but you overplay your hand and charge it up one too many times, alerting the monster to your presence. You pop off a shot using one of your two pistol bullets and make a desperate run for the on switch, but oh no, it's rats on your right side and a locked door on your left. What it do? You're then forced to make an impromptu plan to drag a nearby randomly generated explosive barrel in front of the door to blow it up. Because you dropped that valuable grenade a few minutes back and huzzah, it worked. Then you finally make it to the radio switch, flip it, and of course realize, shit, there's no power. Gotta work back through the environment, find some fuel, and power the generator back up before you can come back to the soldiers' quarters and get the vital information you need from that radio. Now this is only one example of the wealth of lively and unforeseeable scenarios this game provides, courtesy of its suite of simple, interconnected systems. The bunker is effortlessly engaging from front to back through efficient, intelligent, and dense design. Frictional has demonstrated the true essence of great horror here, and that is in order to be scary, you need to be smart. Setting and scripted scares. Over the past few years, game devs have discovered that the setting of World War I is perfect for horror titles. 
Because as Jimmy Darmody put it, It's a living. Waking. Nightmare. Apparently still was working with this guy on Boardwalk Empire, which is why they shot him in the head. At least that made room for Bobby Cannavale as Jim Rossetti. He, he was, uh... You smug <laughs> he, he was something else, I'll tell you that. So the bunker's got this stellar, short and sweet opening that does a great job succinctly teaching the player the core mechanics while also establishing the oppressive atmosphere of the Great War with none other than a fucking gunfight, which really had me feeling out of my element as a longtime Amnesia fan. Gunplay is something we've already touched on, although there is another moment late in the game where Frictional goes all the way with it, but we'll save that for later. World War One is such a brilliant choice of a setting because the horror is so readily apparent, so obvious and poetic. Sure, stumpy ass, wide mouthed motherfuckers are scary. Dick looking umbilical cord experiments and jail faced wraiths and alien landscapes are scary. But do you know what I honestly find more chilling than all of that? War. War is shapeless, formless death an unstoppable man-made force of a thousand writhing heads and arms and triggers and bullets. The ugliest side of human nature unleashed upon the world at full bore. And it is more frightening at a deeper level than any fictional frictional creature could ever be. Which makes it the perfect backdrop for a horror game, courtesy of some of the modern masters of the genre. This game does a fantastic job constantly reminding you that even if you escape the hellish hallways of the titular bunker, you're stepping right back into a nightmare of even in greater proportions. Rhythmic artillery shells rock the base you're entombed in, shaking dust from the ceiling in the same way the stalker does when skittering above you in its constructed pathways, further compounding the already claustrophobic setting. Among my favorite moments of the game is a scene that efficiently establishes the war as just as ruthless a threat as Ratfucker Sam that lives in the walls, and that moment is the pillbox. So a key item required to escape the bunker is a wrench used by Foreman Stafford, one of the many unfortunate soldiers that happened to be stationed in the bunker. After some searching, you acquire a note that implies his last known location was the pillbox, which for the uneducated fucks in the audience, such as myself, is one of these things. Upon making it to the pillbox, after venturing through the treacherous maintenance sector, you are very suddenly given a taste of open air. For the first time in hours, you're inches away from freedom and... <laughs> You're brought back to cruel reality after a mere five seconds of contemplating hope. Stellar wordless storytelling right there, and it was executed during active gameplay. Wonderful! The pillbox is one of a handful of scripted scares that the bunker has in store. Where previous frictional games relied almost entirely on scripted moments such as monsters spawning in certain locations in response to unavoidable player actions, or pre-established scenarios with only one solution like the admittedly awesome tank sequence of Rebirth, the bunker instead breaks with tradition using the open, emergent design we've already discussed that lets unique moments of horror unfold courtesy of its series of interlocking gameplay systems. But that doesn't mean the old ways have been completely left behind. What makes the bunker special is its mix of unpredictable dynamism and scripted scares, relying more on the former while using the latter as well thought out punctuation marks dotted throughout the experience. Some of these scripted moments include the pillbox, the chapel, the Roman tunnels encounter, the damn dirty ditch, and the final boss battle. I've already described the pillbox sniper scene, but I want to rattle through the rest of these because each of them is unique and worthy of discussion and praise. To varying degrees, that is. The chapel is a classic amnesia moment, relying on the tried and true amnesia trope of a monster spawning on cue. You enter the room, you pick up a thing, 15 seconds later the monster enters because you're basically chilling in its dead man cave. A simple moment, an old chestnut, but based on let's play footage I've seen, it's still pretty effective. Ah! Whoa, that was hard. The third scripted sequence is the Roman Tunnels encounter with, and pardon me if I'm saying this terribly, Toussaint Bafoy, a soldier who's gone mad and ripped his own eyeballs out. As you do. I don't know why they let me play with these things. Deep in a labyrinth of hidden tunnels that the French soldiers of the bunker were excavating roams the unhinged Soldat Bafoy, and the lead up to his confrontation really is an all-timer moment for this franchise. Frictional typically gets pretty good voice actors for their speaking roles, but this guy really nails it, chanting into the misty air with a fervor that sets a chilling tone for the minutes to come. Can't 
see the sun fall or the black smoke. Can't see the dirt for all the dead folk. Can't see the ocean. Can't see the trees. Here on out, you're stuck in these foggy tunnels with a man instead of a monster, but he proves to be just as menacing an antagonist as the wall-bound Rat King because, well, he's got a fucking shotgun. What's so special about this sequence is how Frictional manages to make a gunfight scary. When was the last time we saw that shit? There are other examples of the concept out there, but it's Amnesia's combination of the tunnel's otherworldly atmosphere, its ghostly figures in the fog, Toussaint's ramblings, and of course, the shotgun that makes this brief battle so memorable. The blast of TB's trench gun just levels you, even from far away. It smashes open doors that Toussaint approaches in a manner reminiscent of the beast, and you just know that there are so few chances to land your shots that it forms a very unique tension and terror. I imagine this must be what it would have actually felt like to be locked in a close quarters combat situation with an enemy soldier. It's not gonna be a Call of Duty shootout, it's gonna be this. A petrifying game of cat and mouse where you have one chance to react faster than the other guy or your life is over. And the base terror of this surprisingly realistically realized combat scenario is enhanced by the unearthly environment it takes place in. These ancient tunnels peppered with the shadows of wandering ghosts keep you on your toes, wondering if it's merely a shadow in front of you or if it's the raving man with a shotgun bearing down on you. Fun fact about this sequence, one that ties back to our discussion about this game's multifaceted design, if you've unlocked the gas mask by this point and choose to wear it in these tunnels, you will not see these ghostly shadows, and the whole affair turns away from supernatural terror and more towards the real-life horror of being confined in a small space alongside an armed maniac. If you take this route though, the gas mask muffles your sound perception and shrinks your peripheral vision, which changes up the challenges you might face during the firefight. After you defeat Bofoy, you suck right blew his fucking head off and retrieve the dynamite's detonator and get your hands on a big ass motherfucking shotgun, you can optionally push a bit further into the catacombs and reach another special vignette where you leave the bunker on your own, if only for a moment. What a striking image. You're out in the open air. You've made it out, but you're still trapped. And although you feel the sun on your skin, you also hear the sounds of suffering that surround you. Escape is merely 50 feet above your head. You know where this is and you can smell freedom. You can taste it, but it tastes like metal in your mouth and smells like toxic gas. And even if this freedom you found at the bottom of this isolated pit does in fact offer a moment's peace, the more you look around, the more it becomes a revelation of an even more incomprehensible evil than the one occurring above your head. You're surrounded by uncanny slabs of floating, shivering stone. A truly maddening visual after everything you've already seen. If I was Henri, if I was this man in this position, this would be the instant I would snap beyond repair. And after searching around and discovering the only modicum of grim comfort this forsaken trench has to offer in the game's most hidden special item, there is only one place to go. Back inside the bunker. And as a player, surrounded by unknowable secrets from places beyond your understanding, perhaps the bunker is the better place to be. Perhaps the hell you know is better than the one you don't. But if you played Rebirth, you actually know what's going on here, which is why I wish this game was entirely disconnected from pre-established amnesia lore, but whatever. After all of these traumatic set pieces, hopefully you've reached the point where you have your dynamite, and you have your detonator, and you're ready to get the fuck out this hellhole.
Before you do though, you must enter the arena with the beast in a one-on-one -on -one showdown that I have very mixed feelings on actually. On one hand, I really like how you're given one final encounter with the beast that's both scripted and dynamic, set in a creepy and unique environment, but on the other hand, I think it's just, uh, kinda janky? I mean, look, I'm not trying to come across like a bitch here, but I tried to kill this monster in multiple manners 30 plus times on hard, and none of it worked. The way this encounter is put together feels at odds with the rest of the game's design. Your animations are too slow, my resources were too limited, although I know that's partially my own fault, I don't know. It's hard to put my finger on exactly what's wrong with this final battle, but it feels clunkier than the rest of the bunker in a way that has the whole game end on somewhat of a sour note, especially in tandem with the final cutscene. The ending is fantastic in concept, a punchy way to hammer home the themes of humans at war being more monstrous than an actual monster, but it all happens so fast and the cutscene ends so abruptly that it feels anticlimactic. That being said, this ending matches up with the whole game being very light on story, and I personally very much appreciate that after Soma and Rebirth were very much gameplay light. So the ending being quick and tidy doesn't even come close to being a deal breaker for me. At worst, this final boss fight being clunky and the ending feeling abrupt are two negatives facing down an army of positives, only ever so slightly holding the bunker back from being a masterpiece and one of my favorite horror games of all time. I mean, shit, I do think it's at least one of those two things. Maybe it's not a masterpiece that'll stand the test of time like RE or Silent Hill but it's undoubtedly one of the best horror games I've played in many years. Sticking out as a shining beacon of brilliant design in a year that's already overflowing with horror home runs. 2023 truly is the best year for horror video games in decades. Maybe ever. Look into the future. The Bunker is a masterclass in survival horror game design. Intensely exciting, not just due to the fact that it's a brilliant game, but also exhilarating in what it can mean for the future of Frictional. If this is the type of survival horror that this company is going to craft for the foreseeable future, if they build upon the systemic and emergent foundations established in the Bunker, then holy fucking shit y'all, whatever they make next has the potential to be an all-time classic on par with The Dark Descent. I already believe the bunker will be remembered very fondly in the years to come, but again, if they improve upon the incredible work done here, oh my god, they might soon end up creating my favorite horror game of all time. So what do I want out of the next Frictional game? Because my opinion matters so much. As you might have guessed, I would like the bunker, but more. Please, sir. I want some more. I got my fingers crossed for a follow-up that effectively includes multiple bunkers. That is to say, multiple large levels that the player travels between. Possibly in a linear fashion, moving from one large location to the next after completing a dynamite detonator style objective. Or perhaps in a non-linear fashion, with the game world that's entirely interconnected like the bunker, but two or three times the size, with ten unique areas as opposed to five. Perhaps with multiple floors that you travel between with an elevator or some shit. And monsters. Ooh, I want more monsters. I really did enjoy my time with the Rat King, but I also must say, he's a little... predictable? If there's a single thing Frictional really needs to focus on moving forward, it's updating their enemy AI, because I feel like it hasn't really notably improved in over a decade since Dark Descent. Sure, there's the reactive elements of the stock responding in based on player behaviors, but at its core, I still felt like I was hiding from the gatherers in the way I had to respond to the creature's presence. Hide in a cabinet, run when you can. That's not to say I don't still enjoy that familiar formula, Frictional defined it over a decade ago and it still works and I don't want it to go away, but I'd love to see their next title include some monsters that truly surprise and horrify with fresh, strange, and unpredictable behaviors. Give me a creature that crawls on ceilings, something that like walks through walls, I don't know, I'm just spitballing here, but give me some weird ass shit. And I'd also love to see multiple monsters at once. Maybe not throughout the whole game, but in certain sections. Sort of like Frictional's take on the way RE2's mid-game has Mr. X and zombies and liquors all in play in the same environment simultaneously. The Bunker already experimented with this concept with the way the rats can prop the stalker to show up. I think expanding upon that idea of multiple creatures with intertwining behaviors could potentially yield some really interesting results. So yeah, I don't have much more to say, uh, I just wanted to mention Frictional, if you're listening right now, if you're watching, please, give us more of this. <laughs> and also, give these two motherfuckers a pay raise and a promotion, because they did immaculate work here. The fact that two people did all the level design and system design here fucking floors me. I want to shake their hands, because it is some of the highest quality design I've seen in this genre in a time and a half. In conclusion. The bunker's fucking great, go buy it.